artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 167. And today it's me talking about our relationship with time and how artificial intelligence is changing that. This is going to be part recreational complaining, part inquiry, maybe even inspiration to some measure. I think this is important because we are not good stewards of our time, by and large, and we use technology to make the same mistakes only faster and at greater scale. And AI is going to do even more of that. Now, I developed this theme in my second TEDx talk for TEDx Bear Creek Park in February of 2020. Yes, that was a date of some significance, may have been one of the very last TEDx recordings made before lockdown. And the title of that talk was How to Save Us from Being Left Behind by AI. One of the messages of that talk was that for nearly all of history, technology has been a tool that was ours to wield. And as we deployed it, it more or less did our bidding on our schedule. But computers took that to a new level. And even before the development of advanced AI, we were already getting behind the curve with respect to technology. We were letting it call the shots. And we used it to create a world where the demands on our time were unhealthy. We used the technology to create instant messaging and then created the expectation that just because the messaging was instant, so was the response of the person on the other end. I've told people who are coming into a service organization where our job is to respond to customers who are sending us emails that the problem isn't that they expect that we have nothing better to do. It's that they think we have nothing else to do. Because they can't, the customers can't see us working on other things or taking breaks, going to the bathroom, having lunch, taking vacations, having sick days. Their unconscious assumption is that when they send the email, well, they know that email is delivered more or less instantly these days. So they look at their watch, figure, okay, he, she must have gotten that message by now. Let's give them some time to read over my message. Okay, that shouldn't take more than about 30 seconds. Let's give them another 30 seconds to think about what that means and start typing a response. Let me know that they are working on it. Okay, a whole minute has gone by and I haven't heard anything back from them yet. I better give them a call and ask, did you get my email? Hands up. Okay, I know I can't see it, but just participate anyway. Hands up if that's an expectation or that reminds you of where you work or have worked. Do you work or live in an environment where you may be interrupted by multiple instant messaging systems of one kind or another, let alone the telephone. We have come a long way from the day when poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge lamented that the remainder of his poem Kubla Khan was lost because there was a knock on the door while he was writing it down. Now, many people say, but we don't have to participate in that world. We can disconnect from it. It is our freedom to do that. But how realistic is that freedom? How many choices of environment do we have that support that mode of interaction? Or do you work somewhere now where the entire working model is that you have access to expertise and answers from anyone else in the organization instantly? If you are asking questions in such an instant chat medium and hoping for or expecting answers more or less instantly, then doesn't that mean that other people have that expectation of answers from you? 
And so don't you feel obliged to be always available via that same chat mechanism? Now we know this isn't healthy or efficient. University of California at Irvine researchers discovered that it takes 23 minutes to regain focus and momentum on a task after being interrupted. And yet another study shows that workers are interrupted on average 4 to 12 times per hour, which means that we never get back to full velocity. What we might have experienced once is now out of reach. Why have we created such a world? I think a lot of people are living out of fantasy that those studies about the inefficiency and negative effects of multitasking don't apply to them because they're special, they're different, they're superior. I think this line of reasoning is much like arguing that you could drink as much as you want because you don't have a liver. Well, we've largely eliminated the three martini lunch. It's time to tackle this expectation about multitasking. It's time to create working environments for information workers where we can be effective and focused. AI could be the solution to that. It could also be the problem. AI is a force multiplier. Giving it to someone can be like handing a toddler a chainsaw. You may have heard me use this metaphor before on the show. They might use it to cut down a tree, but they're more likely to cut off their leg. We need to grow up in how we understand and use AI. And you'll notice I haven't said much about the technology here. That's because the focus of what I'm talking about here isn't the technology. I've said for a long time now that it's not developing better technology that is the issue. The technology will get better more or less by itself. It's building a better person, building a better society, one in which AI is used to solve our problems and not create new ones. In general, if you have a business that makes some mistakes in its operation, AI is not going to fix those mistakes. It will instead enable the organization to make those mistakes faster and at scale. So the adoption of AI in individual workflows could simply make these problems that I've been talking about much, much worse. The individual human is not going to get substantially better at how they process information. We're not going to suddenly get twice as good at getting back on track after an interruption, but AI will get twice as good every three months, in the case of large language models, indefinitely. And if you think you have problems in being expected to be always available now, what is it going to be like when we have brain-computer interfaces and our connection to the network is literally embedded in our heads? You can't say you didn't have your phone with you. You won't be able to say that you are out of cell range, not when there are networks of low-Earth orbiting satellites always around, no matter where you are in the world. You would have to be inside a lead-lined bunker, which may be the future of executive vacations. Maybe I should patent that idea. So how far are we from a future where you're interrupted in the middle of a show or woken up by your boss yelling literally inside your head, where is that report I asked for? Yes, it sounds like science fiction, but it make rather good if somewhat dystopic science fiction. But do you want to bet that it can't or won't happen? So how did we get into this mess? We have a broken relationship with time. I want to describe one of the symptoms of that, and also a secondary cause, by no means the only one, but one which has preoccupied me over the last year or so. And that was revealed to me when I was listening to Oliver Berkman talking about how one of what we consider to be positive life lessons was actually dangerously misleading. And that's the story about the teacher who goes into the classroom with a big glass jar, some rocks, some pebbles, some sand, and a jug of water. And you no doubt are familiar with this one. He says, can we fit these things in the jar? And if he puts in the sand and then the pebbles and then the rocks, well, there's no room for them all to fit. 
But, he says, suppose that we put the rocks in first, and then the pebbles which fill in the gaps, and then the sand which fills in those gaps, and then he can even fit in the water, and it still doesn't overflow the jar. And he says, what if the rocks are the most important things in life? And of course, the lesson here is that you should take care of the most important things in life first, and not focus on minutiae. All well and good, except that there is an embedded lie in this. And I really want to thank Berkman for pointing this out. And that lie is implicit in the fact that everything that the teacher has laid out on the bench will fit into the jar. There are no more big rocks than will fit into the jar. But that is not our lives. That has not been close to the reality for most, if not all of us, for a long, long time. And those big rocks, which are things that we must do, things that are important to do, things that we want to do, things that fulfill us, there are many, many more of those than we can possibly fit in that jar. And yet we're operating under the misapprehension that if we only discover the right way of putting those things in the jar, we will get everything done. And there is a whole industry of time management gurus that prey upon this misconception for their business. I think of them as like the Martha Stewart of time management. Okay, I'm going to get a bit judgmental here. Martha Stewart based a business model largely on the population of women who were insecure, who wanted to see themselves as superhuman. Certainly wasn't all of her audience, but this was the audience that made her. The ones that were chasing the fantasy that they too, like Martha, could do all of the things that she showed on her show, despite the fact that they were achieved with the backing of many, many people not seen on camera helping out, and that Martha was getting paid to do these things. And as long as I'm stereotyping, hey, I watched Martha Stewart as well. How many husbands looked at their wives lapping this up and shook their heads while falling for exactly the same plot by time management gurus, thinking that if only they found the most efficient way of managing their time, organizing their tasks, they would get everything done. How many of those gurus held out that prospect like a carrot on a stick, carried by them on the back of the donkey? That's you, where you can never catch the carrot. How many of you have worked in environments where you have said, I can't get all of this done, there isn't enough time? And the response was, well, prioritize it. And prioritization is another one of those phantoms, those fantasies. And yes, you should prioritize things so you get the most important things done first. But is the expectation that prioritizing those things will somehow result in getting them all done? What would be the response if you said, okay, this means that a certain number of these things will not get done. Let's decide what's not going to get done. And if the response is, but they all have to get done, then you know that the prioritization argument was a fantasy. But we are heading into a future where AI is not going to make this better. Unless we understand ourselves, our psychology, why we have gotten into this mess, AI will make things worse, because that's what we have done with new technology until now. How much further can you be stretched before you break? If you're consuming some of your information via articles on the web, blogs, podcasts even, and other kinds of digital content. Well, large language models have just dropped the cost of generating that content by about 99.9%. So we are about to face a tsunami of content that resembles, is indistinguishable from, the quality of content that we have hitherto been used to consuming. But you can't even consume twice as much, let alone a thousand times as much. So what are you going to do? This is the future that's being created right now, one where we can't assimilate everything that we need to know or want to know, and that we are going to have to collectively and individually face down FOMO, fear of missing out. That's going to be amplified enormously. We have to reinvent our models for accessing and discovering 
information that we need to know, and we have to reinvent our relationship with time as mediated through technology. AI is going to help create more and more things that we literally cannot understand, that they lie beyond our comprehension. Now, these things have always existed, but more or less by definition, we weren't aware of them. We take it as an article of faith that we can accomplish anything if we organize a tall enough hierarchy to do it. We can go to the moon if we build an organization the size of NASA and organize it into groups that are responsible for the lunar module, the service module, the project management, and so forth. Thousands and thousands of groups managing some decomposition of this. But there's no guarantee that everything we want to know, understand, or do can be accomplished through such a hierarchical breakdown. And it would be surprising if AI didn't greatly increase the number of such things. Now, there's a huge amount of focus at the application level, at the technology level, on this problem at the moment. People who are looking at how to create and use applications and AI to manage the information that comes into you, to summarize long papers and other things. And that's all well and good and important, and we need to do it, and we will talk about it on this show. But we mustn't expect that this is going to somehow restore to us an earlier, more civilized, more leisurely relationship with time. Because without an understanding of our relationship with time, we will simply use it to make the hamster wheel go faster, to run faster, keep trying to catch that carrot that's being held out in front of us on a stick by someone that's on our back. We will never catch that carrot. The trick is not to try and run faster to catch the carrot. The trick is to look up and see who's holding the carrot. I don't have traditional answers to this. I can't tell you, start solving this by getting this app, using this technology, mastering this technique. I've already said that that's not where the answer lies. The best that we can do is to start with personal inquiry and awareness and then leverage that into organizational inquiry and awareness and transformation. It's not easy as long as we are living in an environment that's trying to go in the other direction. But if it was easy, then I wouldn't have to be talking about it on this podcast because we don't tend to look at easy problems. And speaking of which, I still am not generating the content for these podcasts using a large language model. Maybe that makes me hopelessly old-fashioned, but I think you're listening to this because you want to hear a human being, and that's me. I'm the custodian of the vision for this show, which must be doing something right, because the number of requests that I have been getting from public relations representatives has increased enormously lately. Requests for certain people to come on the show, and those have now escalated to a rate of about one a day, which means about at least six out of seven of you are going to be disappointed. And I was only ever accepting maybe half of the ones that came in because they were people who were trying to sell something, people who wanted to promote their company. And I've said this before, we're not a show that looks at how to do business. We're not going to run company profiles. We're not going to have people on who just tell us how great their company is and that's their message. Not knocking that. There are lots of shows that focus on business, that talk about venture capital and return on investment and market penetration and messaging and all of these things. And if that's what you want to listen to, be my guest. There are lots of places to get that. This show is about understanding what this thing is called AI and understanding who we are in relationship to that. Someone who was actually on the show recently told me, outside of our interview, that he thought of the show as being NPR for AI. And I was quite tickled by that. I like that. I might put that somewhere. For those of you outside of North America who don't know what that means, NPR is National Public Radio, kind of like the BBC. But as you can tell, I am vexed 
by this whole question of our broken relationship with time and what AI is going to do to that. Now, I, like everyone else, I'm going to use AI where I can to make what I do more efficient, more effective, to save me time, because I live in a world where that's necessary. And we all talk about ways of doing that on this show. AI and other technology can, of course, fundamentally change that. One example is that I now use mapping applications, GPS or SatNav, to go even to places that I have been to many, many, many times before and know perfectly well how to get there, because it then means I don't have to think about that. Sometimes they even come up with a better answer because they know about road closures or other problems that change the usual answer into a different one. And sometimes people say, but aren't you afraid that you will forget how to navigate by yourself? And my answer is, I hope so. Because then that would mean that hopefully those neurons were being used for a better purpose, something new. And yes, we are still in transition. We're still in a world where it is sometimes important to know how to navigate yourself. But the need for that is fading, as is the need for many things that we can do with technology fading. And sometimes people say, well, but what if you were stranded on a desert island? Wouldn't you then need to know how to do X? And my answer is, if that's your example, the best you can come up with is being stranded on a desert island. I think we have proven the point. I have managed to successfully go a number of decades without ever being stranded on a desert island. I am willing to take the chance that that is never going to happen to me. And I even bet that it is very unlikely for you, the audience. If we didn't forget how to do some things that once were important and vital and part of our everyday lives, we would still be learning how to shoe horses to get to work. We would still be creating fire by spinning sticks in holes in stone. We would still be learning how to repair our own shoes. Technology lets us move on to answer different questions, to find out what's beyond those things. And I've done enough navigating through maps, to want to know what's beyond that. So of course I'm going to use AI to improve my own individual workflow, to do things that I once had to do myself. Because I live in a world where that's an expectation and a possibility. But I also know that this is a world that doesn't understand that it should use that technology to create more downtime, leisure, the opportunity to focus, instead of making the hamster wheel spin faster. Look at how many jobs, especially in high-tech, white-collar businesses, seem to have as their expectation that the amount of work that needs to be done comes out to 60 to 70 hours per week per person. What a strange coincidence. The narrative from these companies might be that we have a certain job to do, and you spend as much time on it as is necessary. But how is it that that works out, that we spend that much time on it, that is that much more than it was a generation ago? It's not because the amount of work needing to be done happened to equal that. It's because we accepted, collectively, a greater burden on our time. We changed the standard. We moved the Overton window. And we moved that time commitment from one of, say, 40 hours per week, which is more or less where it was when I entered the workforce, to this 60 to 70 hours a week standard, because we could. Because we said this is how much work we can do, therefore we must. If we were capable of doing 140 hours of work a week, that's where the standard would be but we have pushed it to the point where we can justify not going any further by saying that it's impossible, that it would cause irreparable and immediate damage to our health. And again, what a world to have created where the only thing that stops us from being expected to work more is the defense that it would put us in the hospital. The Japanese have a word for the consequences of that. It is karoshi, 
death by overwork. While karoshi could become more common outside of Japan, if we use AI to increase the expectations on ourselves. So think of this episode as something of a call to arms, a rallying cry, a plea to come together, organize, discuss, inquire, and transform our relationship with time and technology to one where people come first. I do not believe that this is incompatible with doing healthy business. The purpose of high-tech development is to create a better world. What is the point of doing that if it creates a worse world for the people who are doing it? The big high-tech companies are the worst offenders at this. How can you say that you're creating a better world if in the process you require your people to sacrifice their health, their welfare, and their integrity? Who exactly is going to experience better circumstances as a result of what you're doing if your own people don't, and the people of all the other big tech companies and others that are following this model don't? Who is left? It's a fantasy, a house of cards, a carrot on a stick held in front of our face by something on our backs that we haven't looked at. When we use AI not just to improve how fast we get the job done, but to examine our circumstances, our psychology, and why we created this world, then we will be using it to transform our lives for real improvement. Okay, so that's the end of that rant. I guess I will find out from the listenership figures and other buzz whether that was something that was appreciated or whether I should stick to the usual technology analysis. In today's news, ripped from the headlines about AI, Microsoft has developed a tool called Vol-E, which by no coincidence resembles the Doll-E image generation tool. This one can mimic someone's voice saying anything with just a three-second recording to train itself on. It is not available to the general public, but obviously this or tools like it will soon be available in some form. It can replicate the voice. It can then turn written words into speech with realistic intonation and emotion, depending on the context of the text, and again, sound like you or whoever's voice you have given it. And since that might be someone else, the potential for abuse is fairly obvious. It was trained with 60,000 hours worth of English speech recordings, and can deliver a speech in what's called a zero-shot situation, which means no prior examples or training in a specific context or situation. I've talked here and in other places about examples some time ago of avatars that were created. For instance, uh, William Shatner created an avatar of himself for uh, one company, and Will I Am did the same for another, where that avatar learned how to speak like those respective personalities at the expense of some considerable custom development. And here we have a tool that can do much of the same job with far less investment. And of course, the potential for abuse, as I said, is large. The researchers were aware of that and wrote, quote, since Vol E could synthesize speech that maintains speaker identity, it may carry potential risks in misuse of the model, such as spoofing voice identification or impersonating a specific speaker. To mitigate such risk, it is possible to build a detection model to discriminate whether an audio clip was synthesized by Vol E. End quote. Let's see how long it takes before some black hat develops a tool that can remove the features from an audio clip that allow it to be detected as synthesized. Next week, my guest will be Hod Lipson, an author, speaker, and researcher working in robotics. He is professor at Columbia University, and he has some fascinating research and questions about whether robots could design and make other robots. Could they be curious and creative? Will they ever be self-aware? And how will we know? We'll be talking about that next week 
on AI and you. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.